Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Living Supernaturally with yours truly here, David Martin. And uh, we're going to be continuing with a very special guest. <laughs> yeah, stop with that. Woo, I tell you what, we're going to have fun. Tongue's already not <laughs> working, which is a good sign. And uh, my guest today is someone you're familiar with because you've seen a couple of promo videos of her. You saw her last week as we spoke about her book. The, the uh, Divine Restoration, and today we're going to be looking at her newest book, which is Live for That Day. Woo! <laughs> I'm telling you, th this is an interview you're going to really want to probably play over and over again because I know by faith it's going to be so rich with nuggets of truth, and I'll tell you what, you know, sometimes people don't have a good perspective of the reality of life and the reality that someday we're going to stand before God and give an account of all that we've done. And that day is called the, the judgment seat of Christ. And God's given Christina McCracken some incredible revelation by vision and by study and, and, and just seeking the truth of God's word. And so we are about 200 miles apart, four hours by car. But uh, you know what's amazing with technology? We're right next to each other. So would you welcome onto my screen and your screen, Christina McCracken. Woo! Hi, Hello, David. Christina. It's great to see you. Hello. And you know what? It's good to be seen. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> Even it's though we're hundreds of miles apart, I, oftentimes I'll say that to people, and one person in particular I'm thinking of, I'll say, it's, it's good to be seen, and they say, yeah, it's better than being viewed. <laughs> that's, and, uh, that, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Christina, we are so excited to have you back with us again, and uh, last week's program was so incredible, and, and uh, you know, and I know where we're going because I read the book. But uh, real quickly, let me just, uh, tell you about Christina. She is an attorney, and I tell you what, what a better person to write a book about the judgment seat of Christ than a trial attorney, not just a regular attorney, a trial attorney. And uh, Christina, tell us how this book came into being. And uh, maybe give us just maybe – for those that maybe that didn't get to hear last week's program, take five minutes maybe and just kind of give a little background to who you are and where you're coming from, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure, David. Thank you. It's a delight to be on your program. I'm so grateful for the invitation. So I practiced law for about 27 years, uh, but early on in my practice, my father was a lawyer, and uh, the Lord actually called me um, to practice law. I wanted to be a missionary. And uh, he said, no, you're going to practice law. So I, I, you know, of course, went to law school, undergraduate law school, and then came back and worked with my father. And it was during that time that God really grabbed my life. And um, that's what I wrote about in the first book, Divine Restoration, when I had an encounter with the Lord, when the Lord took me to heaven and revealed to me my calling. And the, my calling is actually Isaiah chapter 59. And I wrote about it in the Divine Restoration book. And so... Um, I lived uh, out the practicing of law and also the calling of God, which is to pull lies and webs off of individuals in the earth. Uh, and, and so uh, about five years ago, uh, I, in that calling, I'm an intercessor, but also I, I started fasting. Early on in my walk with Christ, I, was, I started fasting a lot. And so um, one fast that I had and one time that I was uh, interceding and, and praying, uh, the Lord took me out of myself, out of my body. And um, he, he said, your number's been instinctively knew, David, that I wasn't going to die, but I was about to see what my life looked like before him. And as I stood before him, uh, my life flashed before my eyes and I saw the good in it. And I saw uh, the, the unprofitable or the, the good that would go to heaven and the unprofitable that was, that was worthless. And I remember thinking, I there were no more appeals. I couldn't ask for any, you know, more time. I was standing before the Lord as if I was at the judgment seat of Christ. And I wasn't, I wasn't pleased with what I saw. In fact, a, a tear fell from my right eye. And I thought, I wish I had brought more to the Lord. I, I needed more time. And so after that encounter, I, I came to myself and I started beseeching the Lord uh, for more time, more time to make things right. And David, what's interesting about the encounter was, is that I was a spirit-filled believer 
uh, obedient to the Lord, teaching the word of God, loved Jesus, loved his people, um, and, and did and knew, it walked through everything I need to walk through in the word of God. Uh, but uh, I still didn't have what I wanted to bring to the Lord. And as I saw my life before him, it wasn't anywhere uh, what I would be satisfied with uh, in eternity. And so again, I asked the Lord for more time. And so when I did that, the Lord gave more time, but he also, uh, I started seeking him about what would be, what would, how could my life be better and uh, to bring him more bounty. And so at the time my mother was living, I was very close to my mother and the Lord gave me a dream. And in the dream, my mother was running to, uh, into a, the seashore into the ocean. And she was so happy, but my mother didn't swim. And so I was really uh, surprised at the dream and I was on the shore back and she looked back at me. There's no way I'm going to return. And she was so happy just running into the ocean. And so I came out of the dream and I said, Lord, what was that about? And he said, your, your mother's ready for heaven, but you aren't. And that really surprised me because my mother, you know, David, my mother was a quiet believer. She, she loved the Lord. She had faith and, and she, she loved his word, but she didn't speak a lot about it. You know, our personalities were very different. And so I started looking at my mother's life and trying to discern what did she have in there that, that qualified her to be ready for heaven, yet I was not ready for heaven. And the Lord started to reveal to me that it was, it was love. It was the measure of the divine love in my life. I watched her life and she was, uh, she unconditionally loved people. She had truth in her, but she still unconditionally loved people. And so I started to this quest and this journey, David, of, of divine love and reading the scriptures in Corinthians and reading on, on God's love. And it was that, that the Lord started to really unfold this book. And then I had an encounter with the Lord where um, I had, uh, he had given me some books to read uh, at an event that I went to. I went to an event for a, a man of God for his ministry and they gave some books away at the event. And so I took these books home and because I'm an author, David, uh, you, you know, I, I look at the books and I'm always, you know, honor uh, the writing of, of books. And so when I took the books home, one of the books was called The Bema. And it was written years ago. It was a novel, but it really grabbed my heart. And uh, as I kept reading it, and I read it over twice, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I heard, actually, I heard the Lord's voice. And he said, I want you to write a book on the beam of Christ. And so when the Lord said that to me, I, I actually got excited about it because as a lawyer, you know, I'm, I'm always preparing people to go into courtroom, readying them to stand before a judge, readying them to prepare their case, to enter in with their testimony, with their evidence. And, um, and so I thought, well, that would, that's perfect because, you know, we're readying all of us getting ready to stand before the Lord on that day for our, for our evaluation of how we lived our life. So it was just a joy how the Lord gave, gave that book, uh, to me to write. And I spent the last year and a half, it just was published in 2020 and spent a year and a half before that, uh, writing the book and, and studying the scriptures and asking God for revelation on, on, on standing before him and reading ourselves. So I'm really, really excited to bring this book to the body of Christ. Well, Christina, between the, the visions and, and revelation and the study, I mean, it's so obvious you put a lot of time and effort into this. I'm, I love the Greek. I love the Hebrew. I'm, I'm, I'm not a scholar in either, but I love the languages. And I love, you know, looking at the, the, the meaning of words, uh, the original meaning of words. And wow, you do that so well. I mean, it's like almost every paragraph, there's going to be a definition of this is what this word means. And it just it, it, it adds such a depth to your writing. I just really commend you for that. Thank you. It, it actually, it, it does. It helps all of us when we can take the words apart from the scriptures and, and you know, extrapolate their meaning or their, the depth of their meaning. It makes the sentence, it makes the concept, it makes the thought, you know, just go deeper, farther and wider. And, exactly. and uh, how exciting. Well, wow, there's so much, so many questions I have in mind, but you know, something that I, I think people really, uh, need to understand uh, that I, I see a lot of people confused when you say judgment seat of Christ, what exactly is that? Uh, and then what is the difference between that and the great white throne judgment? 
And uh, I know a number of years ago, I, I did a study on the millennium. So I never heard anybody teach on the millennium, but there's, and there's not a lot in scripture, but it's, there's significant stuff there. But one of the things I recognized is the, the beam of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ is really what happens and that's the first thing that happens at the millennium. And I think maybe even before the, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's like that's going to be our entrance into the millennium. But what I recognized in, in the study I did back then is everything in this lifetime, everything you do, every little cup of cold water, every kind word, and everything that you do that has value, you know, that's motivated by love, there's going to be a reward. And, and those rewards are going to stick with you through all of the millennium and then all through eternity. Yes, that's, that is exciting. That's correct. You know, there were so many instances when I was writing the book um, of the Lord speaking. And one of those was uh, how we have often forget or we often forget about what we've done for Christ. And uh, we, we don't think a lot about it or, or we uh, reduce its value. But the Lord remembers everything. And I remember as I was writing a particular chapter, you know, about God not forgetting uh, our works for him. And uh, as I was putting that together, the Lord took me in a vision and, and I saw all these things that I'd done for the Lord in the past. And now I had totally forgotten them couldn't re didn't remember them but the lord just had them all displayed and i thought oh my gosh you know he remembers every single detail all the things that we have forgotten he has a memory of and and that's beautiful because the Lord does see, he does remember, and he will reward. And so everyone's faithfulness, your faithfulness to Jesus, no matter if you don't see it right now, or no matter what you're going through, your faithfulness will be remembered and will be rewarded. And what that, a joy that is. That is, that, that is, and it's exciting. And, and to me, I find it so motivating, you know, and you do it so well, and you bring it out so well in the book, because it's, you know, every day we should be motivated to live for that day. And, you know, we, we need to look for opportunities to, to do good. And again, you bring it out so well. And there's one chapter he spoke about love and particularly about loving your enemies and, and really how to garner you know, the, the biggest, best reward. <laughs> I have to work on that. Yeah, you know that, you know, I, I'm teaching a, a class right now and we're going through the chapters of the book and each chapter I'll begin it each week and I'll say, oh my gosh, this is my favorite chapter. And the, the ladies in the, the class all laugh because each chapter is, I, I think to myself, my favorite chapter, but that chapter on garnering great rewards, you know, the scriptures and the gospels tell us Jesus out of his own mouth says certain things that will, that will receive great rewards in the kingdom. And those, those uh, scriptures actually relate to our enemies. Yeah. And, and I think I just thought that was so, uh, that was so God to allow, you know, the fact that when your enemy comes against you, when you can love him and when you can do good toward him, therein uh, allows you to receive great rewards in heaven. And, during this hour, David, you know, there's a lot of persecution, a lot of controversy, a lot of, lot of attack and, and a lot of things going on, especially uh, against the body of Christ. But this is our greatest hour, David. This is the hour where we can rise up in the spirit and bless our enemies. And this is the hour that we can rise up to garner those great rewards because there's never been a greater hour to be able to pray for love and bless uh, those that are opposed to, to Christ. Everyone, I'm telling you, you got to get this book because it's going to be, it's going to motivate you. We have to recognize we are created by God for a purpose. His ways aren't like our ways. They're, 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 <laughs> they're into a natural mind to, and they're kind of screwed up, you know, but you know, it's like, uh, it doesn't make any sense. I, I can remember Christina, gosh, it's almost 40, 35 years ago, I made a hundred thousand dollar mistake. I, God told me not to do something, and I went ahead and did it anyway. I was, well, it wasn't a sound worse than what it really was. But he said uh, there was something wrong with the business deal and, and not to do it. But it was a good deal. It was a two, uh, the guy was offering me twice as much 
for, for the, uh, the business that I had built up while going to Bible school. Now we're launching the ministry. Christian man that was buying it offered me $200,000. We were selling it for 100000 but he offered me twice as much. The only difference was it was going to take me five years to get it. So instead of getting $100,000 right up front, I would get like $6,000 a month, something like that, for many years, uh, like five years. And uh, I had my CPA check it out. I had my Christian CPA. <laughs> One of those nice parts about being in Tulsa. I had a Christian CPA, Christian attorney, Christian banker. Everyone checked the deal out. And uh, it all checked out. I mean, I won't go into all the details of that, but it all checked out. The only problem was there was a check in my spirit. There was there was something wrong. God said there's something wrong with this. And see, God can see what no one else could see. Yeah. And that was a fraud. And uh, he could see the people's hearts. Anyway, I'm asking God for wisdom in how to fix the problem now that I lost the money. And uh, now we launched the ministry. We're six months into uh, not having money. My house went into foreclosure. They're trying to repossess my car. And I'm saying, God, I need wisdom. And he says, he, he, I, I signed a miracle. That's what I'm saying. I need a miracle. He said, no, you need wisdom. And so I'm asking for wisdom. And one of the things he said to me is, I'm, I'm in church the next Sunday morning. And he says, okay, you want to get out of this problem? Give some extra money. <laughs> you know, that's, I had a laugh because I didn't have any. I mean, I lost it all. You know, it wasn't like that. He was asking me for a lot. It was just, it, it was more than, than I could afford. But you know what? It set the stage, then a number of other things, and the, the need was completely met in six weeks. Amen. It, it, Amen. it was profound wisdom to, to give, and, and that's God's upside-down realities. They don't make sense to the natural mind. Yes. And loving your enemies is one of those. And I'm, I'm telling everybody, when you read the book, you're going to see Christina break these principles down verse by verse word by word actually and you want to love your enemies i honestly believe as she just said we're in the greatest time ever and god never not, never wakes waste anything and it's like this the bad news is an opportunity for us to garner woo, to, <laughs> to, to gather up this great abundant entry into this eternity Amen. It, it really is true. And, you know, to, to be able to bless your enemies and to be able to forgive them and to love them as the Lord requires to be sons of the most high. That is, that's what the scriptures say. And um, it requires the power of the Holy Spirit. And so you cannot do this in your flesh. And so the, and that's what the Lord wants. He wants us to come out of the flesh out of, you know, of course, our carnal life and get in this high place of the spirit so we can live in this high place of the spirit. And that is where the rewards are. The rewards, of course, are not in our carnal flesh. Those will be burned up. But when we stand before the Lord, the things that we've done in the spirit, the things how we have walked in the spirit and done the works of God, those things will remain. So the Lord is challenging us, this, the, our, our, you know, the remnant here, the, the, this last round that we have to, to come and rise up higher. And I believe we have the greatest opportunities, David, right now to, to be able to stand before the Lord ready. And uh, with all that is going on, we can bless and not curse. And, and <laughs> I also believe it's going to change the atmosphere because God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we as the body of Christ do the commandments of God and do what God has commanded us to do, it will change atmospheres. It will change circumstances, change nations. It, will, it is the power source on the earth. We are the power source on yes. the earth. The Holy Spirit is the power source on the earth. And so when we, we are given a chance, you know, remember the, in Acts, the apostles, when they were in, in prison, right? I think it's Acts chapter four, and they're in prison and they were persecuted. What they do, they started worshiping God and praising God and the, and the Lord, you know, shook, shook the place, right? And, uh, and so I, I believe it's the hour for us and, and we're given this great opportunity. And so this book will help define some things in our lives that will help us come to that place to go higher with the Lord. Yes. Uh, so praise the Lord. Well, I'm, I'm confident as I, I know you are too, that this thing is going to turn around. I mean, we, God's not coming back for a wimpy church. He's not coming back for a defeated bride. He's coming back for a victorious church. And, without spot or wrinkle. 
And we, you know, we're going to see this thing turn around. And, you know, but as I was reading the book and, and that chapter on loving your enemies, I kept thinking about Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> God, I mean, talk about, talk about someone that you have to really work at loving in, in the natural. You know, just because of some of the things that she's, she's done or is doing and what she represents. But, you know, it's a challenge. And you know what I found, Christina, just in, in the last couple of weeks as I've read the book and I'm, I'm, I'm practicing loving <laughs> <laughs> some of these people. You know what? You, you know, you have a, you, I, I feel anyway, kind of a sense of victory. It's like, <laughs> you know, you might have done some stupid things in, in Washington today and you might have made a fool of yourself, but you know what? God loves you anyway. And I feel good because I chose to love you. You know, I don't love her actions. I don't like what she does or other people, you know, you know, in, I just use her as one example. I can probably name a hundred, but there's such a sense of victory when you, when you're walking in obedience. Amen. That's true. And you know, every realm of influence, the Lord allows us to be challenged with, with something that opposes God uh, within us. And that's just, that, that's part of being in the body of Christ. We, you know, and Jesus said uh, we would overcome, right? By the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so that's how we overcome. He says, you know, greater is he that's in me, in, in you than he that's in the world. So we, that Holy Spirit power within us is greater. And so every realm of influence and, and anywhere we go, we're going to see something that opposes, but this is our opportunity to, to rise up and to pray and to bless. And the Lord sees that, you know, yeah. one of my, favorite chapters and it's got so many layers in it in the Bible is the book of Job and many uh, many of the listeners have studied that but at the end uh, chapter I think is 42 in the book of Job the last chapter you know God after he's he's dealt with Job and, and dealt with the things that he wanted to with Job he said I want you to pray for your friends now those were the ind individuals that spoke uh, wrongly of God but yeah. he said I want you to pray and he and God said your prayer I'll receive your prayer, Job, I'll receive for your friends. And when Job obeyed God and prayed for those friends that had spoke wrongly of Job and wrongly of God, it, the Bible says God turned the captivity of Job. And that's a really interesting word. It means that it, it, whatever the enemy was holding over Job's life was turned and released. And we know in the scriptures that Job received double portion uh, at, 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 after all of these uh, circumstances with God. And so there are so many mysteries of the obedience when we obey God, mysteries, but the mysteries of, of our obedience release things that need to be released to release blessings over circumstances, over people, to change atmospheres, to also to restore, bring restoration in our own lives. So as we're actually obeying God in this, God is doing things in the spirit realm to bring blessings and order uh, over our lives. And so it, it's, it's, it's hard because it takes the spirit to do it, but the benefits are so much greater. Amen. 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 You know, something I was thinking of as you were, you were talking and I've actually thought of it before and I wanted to mention it. You were talking about at the judgment seat of Christ, how he remembers all the good things that we do. And what flashed in my mind is a conversation I had with Kevin Zadai uh, last summer. I had an opportunity spending a couple weeks with him. And those of you that don't know who he is, uh, he, uh, he died like 30 some years ago, uh, went to heaven, was actually mentored by Jesus. Uh, he said it seemed like two weeks, but it's probably just a matter of minutes, earth time, uh, that he was actually dead on, a, on an operating table or dentist table. But in any event, what he said, what was so amazing is that when he was in the presence of God, there was no knowledge of evil. There was no memory of, of anything bad. And I couldn't help but think of, of, as he was sharing this with me, how <laughs> Peter's story, you know, thinking about Peter and, and how Peter must have felt just, I mean, so condemned, you know, because of what he did in, in denying Jesus, you know, uh, when he was crucified there or going through the questioning and he not denied him three times. 
And he said, oh, no, no, I'll die for you, Jesus. But Jesus said, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> but then he denied him three times. And I can, I can just imagine Peter, you know, in, in the three days that he, you know, when, he, when he rose from the dead and now, oh, he's alive. Now, how am I, how am I going to deal with this issue? And, and I can see myself kind of play acting. Well, I'm going to say this and this. And no, I'm going to say this and that. And uh, anyway, when he finally gets to Jesus and he, and he presents his case and Jesus, I, I can imagine this, he'd say, what? What are you talking about, Peter? I don't remember that. Because you know, the Bible says he removes our sin as way, far away as the east and from the west to a place towards forgotten, never to be remembered. And all through our life, you know, whatever bad we do, it's, it's not going to be remembered. What, what's going to be remembered and what's going to be rewarded is everything you did that was good. Everything that was motivated by love, the gold and the silver and the precious stones. And, and again, these rewards are for all of eternity. Got that? I mean, what's, what's a vapor of life? When it's like a drop in the ocean, it's like God has given us this, this lifetime to do exactly what Christina said in her book. I got to find the book here, put it up here. Uh, actually, I, I'm looking, I can see it on your screen there. It's behind you. <laughs> Here's a close up of it. Well, we get it right here. Live for that day, garnering rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, it's like, Kevin says this all the time, that the, this whole world is rigged. It's rigged in our favor. And it's rigged in such a way, planned in such a way, that God, God is trying to help you to win everything possible. And we just got, you know, this, this book is going to help you to wake up and to recognize what this life is all about. Live for that day live for that day where everything's going to be remembered everything good that you did every cup of cold water every every widow's might you gave every offering every act of love Whew. christine i'm excited <laughs> it is. I, I love what you just shared because that's how i felt when i was writing the book and the fact that god would call someone i mean i know there are other books written on the judgment seat but i felt so privileged that he'd call me as a lawyer because i knew in my spirit that he was beckoning the body of christ to get ready because he had rewards for them and he wanted them to finish their race strong you know when i wrote the book last year my husband and i got to go to greece and, and we went into corinth and we ran in the stadium in in athens and uh, uh, as I was, you know, writing the, the parts of this book and running our race. And I felt so strong that the Lord was saying to all the body, come on, get down on the field. It's ready. It, it's the hour for you to run, to get out of the stands, to get on the field and to get on the starting line. And we cannot undo the past. And, and we have this, pro, this, this, this thing that we do that we're always thinking about the past and we're thinking about what we didn't do or what we, we could have done or what we should have done. And those things are over. But today we have today and we have today to live for Jesus and day today to bring our gifts and talents to him and today to get back on the starting line. And what I love David is all of us can get back on the starting line. Yeah. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter if we're, you know, on our last breath, we can start, back over today with Jesus and get back on the line. And I would see people on that starting line, some in wheelchairs, some on crutches, some uh, others are pushing, you know, pushing uh, in their wheelchair. Uh, some are limping, some are crawling, but they're on the line. And I believe the Lord is saying, get, you know, get off the stands and get down in the field and get back on the line because I have, uh, I have a good ending for you. I have a good reward for you. I just need you to get on the field to get that reward and to follow me on the field. You know, I'm the author and the finisher of your faith. Yes. And so I, I, I this book is motivating the people, the individuals that have read it, that I, I, you know, gave to read. And I said, I want to hear feedback. They all said to me, Christina, we kept picking it back up over and over again, but it motivated us it, and, it, and it got our minds and our hearts more focused and ready and intentional for our race of faith, our individual race of faith. And David, you know, you and I have talked about this, that 
that we all have an individual race to run. You know, your race is your race. Mine is mine. Each one of us have a race to run and we come over and we help each other, right? We, we motivate each other. Iron sharpens irons. We encourage each other, but then we have to get back on our race and run our race of faith because that's what we'll be evaluated for. I won't be evaluated for yours. You won't be evaluated for mine and so on. We'll each be evaluated for the gifts and talents we were given, for the race we run, ran, and the faithfulness we were to the Lord in our race. And, and I love that part. You know, you and I talked about how we like, you know, that's, that's liberating and that's freeing because we each are, are uh, evaluated just on our gifts and talents and mm -hmm. our abilities in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, as you say that, there's, of course, you did a whole chapter on talent. And, and I think it's a whole chapter, but uh, you, you I mean, I, one of the things you said that, uh, using my words carefully, I was going to say blew me away, and that's by a good, good visual picture. But it was just astonishing <laughs> to me to, to know that the talent that when Jesus gave the one, ta one talent to one and five to another and then 10, I had no idea. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, maybe like a $100 value or something like that. But what, what you brought out in the, in, in, the, in, in the study you've done is a talent was equal to 15 years, as I remember, of wages. That was, and that was a lot to, to, for the Lord. And you know, to me, it just puts it so much more into perspective to our lifetime. I mean, he gave us this lifetime to invest for him. Want to talk, want to talk about that? Yes, so that that's correct, and I have to tell you that I I was challenged at the Lord in in that regard because I I know that there a lot of us don't value the way God values, and one of the things the Lord started talking to me about as I was writing the book is the value that he places on our gifts and talents. And, you know, the talent being so valuable and he used that as the example uh, in, in, in his parable because he places such a high value on the gifts and the talents that he's placed in each one of us. And what happens is, is because we haven't rightly valued it, we, we diminish it or, or insecurities or fears or, or rejection or hurt or something has caused us to, to not develop that talent and, and use it for his glory. And so I want to challenge everyone that hears this message to revisit the talent of the Lord that he's given you because it's highly valued. It's, it's a part of him. It's a part of who he is. It's a part of Jesus that is given to you. And he wants you to take that talent, whether you have one, two, five, however many or, or that you have, you'll be evaluated on that talent. So I, I challenge you to grab that talent back and, and bring it before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I commit this talent fresh and new to you today for you to take it unto yourself and for you to glorify yourself through this talent in my life, because that talent is so valuable to Jesus. It's a part of him. And he handed it to us to steward. And when we stand before him, we just, we hand it back to him and, and he will evaluate us based on what we did with that gift and that talent. And so I share in the book, I said, if you're a singer, start singing for Jesus. You know, if you're a painter, start painting for Jesus. If you're an encourager, start encouraging people for Jesus. Whatever gift or talent you've been given, start using it for Jesus. Ask Jesus to give it back to him and say, Lord, take this talent for your glory and let it increase for your kingdom. Make great of this talent in my life. Amen. Amen. Something you brought out in the book too that I was interesting is a mistake that so many people make is comparison. You know, they compare themselves to somebody else. You know, what, what my talent is is different than yours. And Sometimes we feel like, you know, we're lesser because someone else has more than you know, the person that was given 10 versus the person that got one. But the reward is the same for everybody. And what's interesting is something I thought of as I was reading it is uh, John and Charles Wesley, who I think it was in the 1800s, they really revolutionized the world. I mean, radically changed, evangelized the world at that time and uh, great two great men of god that i mean literally 
I don't know how many millions of people they got into heaven and, and still their teachings are being being used yet today in many ways. And you know, that was their, they used their talents. And and what was interesting though, when you read their mother's autobiography, one of the things that she said is her talent, her gifting, her calling, if you will, was to raise godly children. And you know what? I think Christina, I think well, first off, we know she accomplished her goal. She, she finished her race. She did what God wanted her to do. And because she did what God wanted her to do, her boys did what he, what he wanted them to do. Well, when they get to heaven, they're going to have the equal reward. Well, you know, I, I love that you brought this up because God has a divine supply chain. And we're all in that supply chain. And whether we're the intercessor or we're the encourager or we're the prophet or we're the teacher or we're the, the servant, no matter who we are, we're in a divine supply chain. And God has set this up. And it's beautiful when we all come to the table and we all come and bring our gift and talent. You know, my, my father would use this word and he'd say comparisons are odious. Now, I grew up with that word, and I didn't know what the word odious was. So as I was writing this, the Lord brought this, that word back to mind. Uh, growing up, comparisons are odious. Well, actually, that word means stinky or, or smelly. And I think <laughs> that's exactly what comparisons are. They, are. they are stinky. They're smelly. They have no part in the body of Christ. And that is really exciting because every one of us, every one of us, the unseen and the seen, because some of us, God's called to be out in the front to be seen. But many of us, God's called to be in the back where we aren't seen. But God knows every single detail of each one of our lives. And so what we have a tendency to do is we, we have a tendency to look at the things that are the individuals that are seen and somehow inside compare that with us. That God doesn't do that. He does not do comparisons. Your life is evaluated based upon your gifts, your talents, how he created you, the abilities that he's put in you, the fulfillment of what he's called you to do. And I, I think that's one of the most liberating things if, if each one of us can grab hold of that. Because what it does is it causes us to stop looking at anybody else and start looking directly at Jesus for our race for our individual race that we have to run in faithfulness to him. Amen. And I believe if we all do that, this, this whole thing is going to come to pass. And this beautiful, glorious bride is going to be seen, not all, you know, in the earth, yes, but in heaven. Yes. And I've also believed, David, that God is, is wanting, Jesus is wanting to say, not to a few, but to all of us, well done, good and faithful servant. Yes. You know, it, God doesn't have just ha have limited uh, benefits and limited rewards. He has unlimited benefits and unlimited rewards. And I believe the Lord's challenging his body to say, come to the table, come to the starting line. I'm ready to display my glory through you. I'm ready to display my power through you. And I'm ready to display my rewards, my mm -hmm. kingdom rewards. Amen. You know, yeah, what, what, what keeps rising up on the inside of me is the importance of using our time wisely. You know, as it says in uh, Ephesians, where it says, Awake thou that sleepest, you know, arise from the dead and he'll cause you to shine. And then it goes on to say, redeem the time because the days are evil. And, you know, recognizing, you know, again, and this is what I like about the book is it's motivating to use your time, you know, whatever time we have left and it's less time than we had yesterday, <laughs> but whatever, whatever time we have left, let's purpose to garner another reward. Let's purpose to, to do something that's not going to be burned up with because it's wood, hay and stubble, just nonsensical stuff. You know, as I'm saying this, I'm reminded of, of a story I have a hard time always telling because I cry. When I, whenever I tell the story, but the, uh, there's a funeral director here in town. He's now gone out to be with the Lord. But probably about 30 some years ago, I, I was working with him on, on this business that I sold. Uh, it was a publishing business and uh, I was publishing a story about him. And he, to he told me the story that his wife, Wanda, uh, was just a wonderful do-good person. 
and she always uh, did good for people. So she was garnering a lot of rewards. But one of the things that happened is she got very sick and actually uh, she died. And wh while she was in the hospital, uh, there's like 17 people that were praying for her. And when she died, she went to heaven. And God said, uh, Wanda, there are 17 people praying right now in the hospital, but I send you back. <laughs> and he said, the choice is going to be yours. And you know, I'll send you back or you can stay here. And, and he said, but, you know, and she had already, she, she can see the bliss of heaven. But, she, but he said to her, Wanda, you don't have any sheeps. And she said, Lord, what are sheeps? And, and he said, well, that's somebody that you personally are involved in and winning them to the Lord. And you know, she, she had all the rewards of uh, what we're talking about, garnering rewards for good deeds and, and stuff like that. But she was missing the reward of sheeps, you know, the stars in her crown for those people that she won to the Lord. And he said, Wanda, if you, if you want, I'll send you back so you can get some more sheep. So she came back and uh, she, she told her what the Lord, told her husband, Jack, what, was ha what happened. And he, he thought in his mind that, that, yeah, there's exactly 17 people, you know, downstairs praying. Anyway, what happened was, he said from that day forward, not one day, not one person escaped her without her telling them their need for Jesus. Mm. And that's beautiful. The, the, uh, here's the part that's hard. Time went by and, you know, she won so many souls, got so many sheaves for the Lord, but she got sick again and she ended up back in the hospital and, uh, she went into a, a coma in, in the operating room. So she's back in the hotel, back in the hotel room, back in the, the, uh, a hospital room, and a nurse comes and says, Mr. Hayhurst, would you give Wanda a message? And he says, well, I'd like to, but she's in a coma. And she says, I know. Uh, I, I was one of the nurses that was attending her. And uh, I, I think, though, if you speak to her, she'll hear it. And he said, okay, what would you like me to tell her? Tell her, he, she said, she has one more sheep. Amen. Amen. She said, Amen. when she was in the, in the operating room, before we, before we did the procedure, and before she went to the coma, she, we, we can tell she was in excruciating pain. But everybody heard her story. And nobody accepted it. What I just did. Amen. <laughs> so if you tell her, she's got one more sheep. I think she'll hear it. So he said, okay. He told her, and she died. Praise the Lord. With one more sheep. And I just want to encourage everybody. You know, what's important to the Lord is our souls. And, and we're talking about rewards, but the greatest reward is going to be those people that you win to the Lord, that you witness to. And we, we just need to make every day count. So we get every sheave possible, and we have every reward possible. And, and, and again, I can't encourage you enough. This book, Live for That Day, that's what this day is all about. That's what this life is all about. God's given us this, this moment in time to live for him and to live for that day. So when we stand before him, he's going to say, as Christina pointed out, well done, good and faithful. I'll let you talk. I'll have to drip my eye. <laughs> wow. No, thank you for sharing that testimony and that story. That was needed. Amen. Bringing in the sheep. You know, when you talk about rewards, it, it's, it's really not about God giving us rewards, but yet he does. And he's very passionate about doing it, but they're all about him. 
everything is about Jesus. The souls are about Jesus. We love because of Jesus. We give because of Jesus. We go because of Jesus. It's all about him. And in that passionate love that we have for him, he says, well, but I want to give that passionate love back to you. And I display that back to you through rewards. But I'll tell you what, there is nothing like the rewards of souls, souls for the kingdom. And, you know, I talk about that in the book. It's really important because every single one of us have a sphere of influence. Every one of us has a sphere of influence. And that sphere of influence is for us to influence for Jesus, for the kingdom, for souls, for the kingdom. You know, as you were speaking, I, I, I want to share just this brief story. A, a individual that I know had a, had a vision at one time and, and he saw the Lord let him see all these gravestones and they were little bitty gravestones and on each gravestone was a number. And he saw lots of little gravestones with numbers on them. And he said, Lord, what are those gravestones? And, and he goes, those are, are babies that have been aborted. And, and he said, well, but Lord, what, what are those numbers on those gravestones? He says, those are all the individuals that they would have brought to Christ if they had been living. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, you know, really, truly, really, truly, each one of us have individuals in our life that God has assigned to hear the gospel for us to bring in. And uh, that was really impressionable to me. I don't know what my number is and I'm not counting. And that's, that's the, that's up to Jesus. But I do know that my sphere of influence is going to hear about Jesus and how to come into the kingdom of God. And I want to challenge every single person hearing this, that you let you talk to Jesus about your sphere of influence and that sphere of influence, start praying about the ones in that sphere of influence that need to come into the kingdom for the time is now. Yes. Yes. Wow. Well, everybody, you might, you might be asking, how can I get the book? And uh, if you call our ministry, (laughs) <laughs> you won't be able to get it because we don't have any of the books. We're not selling the book, but I'm recommending it. And uh, you can uh, purchase the book on Amazon. And I encourage you again, you can go to Amazon. I'll look look up one more time here. Live for, get, get in the right place there. Live for that day. Uh, or just do a search for Christina McCracken and uh, you, you will find her. And uh, this book and the other book, divine restoration and I, I promise you, you you will be very very thankful for the book and for the revelation that comes in it uh christina we got a few minutes left anything special you want to leave with the people well well david thank you for having me on the broadcast i i you can feel the passion because i'm passionate about this day and about preparing the bride for that day in readiness and i really i i this is not to quote promote a book, but it really does. The book is so helpful and I return to it. And even as I'm teaching it, I, it it helps so define our life and helps give it a, give us a, a check and an evaluation now, you know, evaluating our lives now about where we stand so we can ask the Lord, you know, to ready us uh, for that day. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is that the Lord would try our heart and find out if there's any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. And, and I love that because when we ask God to, to get us ready, uh, he is so faithful to get us ready and to reveal the things in our life that need to be altered or changed so that we can run a successful race. Paul was so passionate about his successful race. He, he wrote about his successful race and he was readying himself for the rewards that awaited him in heaven because of his successful race. And so I think this just, this book is a reminder that we're on a course and, and some of us need to shake off uh, some of the past, shake off our daily, uh, you know, grind. Some of us need to pull out some of these electronics that are connected to us that are slowing us down. And, and as Hebrews said, set aside every weight that so easily ensnares us that we would run our race with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of God. So I would close with saying, set aside every weight that so easily ensnares and and start running your successful race. Amen. Amen. Well, actually I got about five more minutes here, but well, maybe seven or eight minutes, but let me make an announcement here. Well, before I do the announcement, as we were 
talking about everyone's got a number. You know what my number is? Most What's your people. number? <laughs> I know my number. Well, actually, I know. Actually, you know, what's interesting is the number that God told me that we were going to be responsible for seeing coming to heaven in 1983. I, I heard the importance of having a vision. I didn't have one. Marilyn Hickey spoke about the importance of having a vision, writing it down, and uh, I didn't have one. So literally in, in uh, 1983, I came home from that meeting and I said to my wife, I'm going to go up on Prayer Mountain. <laughs> it's kind of funny I call it Prayer Mountain. It's just a, a, just a flat spot on the, on the back of our yard, but Prayer Mountain sounds more spiritual. So anyway, I, there was a place on Prayer Mountain that had like an oval track. It's probably an eighth of a mile, about a half an acre. And I would just walk in this big oval and I would pray every day. And I said, I'm going to go up and I'm not going to come down until God gives me the vision. Well, praise God, his grace <laughs> spoke to me. And uh, what's interesting is what he said to me, you know what? I don't know if you can see it behind me here. I'm going to do something that's kind of not normal protocol. But right behind me, I'm going to point at it right up there. I'm going to reach up there and grab that. But this, uh, this board was hanging on the fence where I would walk. And every day, I, you know, I'd see that board there, and it was just a blank board. But I said, God, when you give me the vision, I'm going to write it down. And uh, so anyway... <laughs> I don't know how many laughs. I was praying for maybe an hour, and then he spoke to me, and he said, believe me for souls. I said, well, okay, give me a number. And he said, how many do you want? It's kind of funny what God says. Well, whenever I said it wasn't right, I, I, 5,000, 100,000, 10,000, 500,000, I kept going higher and higher. And, and anyway, he said, when I got to a million, he said, you can stop there, but it's just the beginning. Well, when I, so I said, okay, I'm going to go write that down on that, on that board, right? Someone got my, my can of red paint from the garage and my paintbrush, and I'm, I'm you know, thinking about writing it. And God says, well, I'm walking back. You can't do it alone. You're going to need partners. He said, you gonna need to believe for a 1,000 people to come alongside of you. I said, okay, I'll write that down. And then he says, but most important, you have to keep your heart right. I'm thinking to myself, that is not going to fit on this small board I'm about to paint on. So I said, how about if I sum it up and just say, Jesus, number one? He said, that'll work. Okay. So what I did, 1983, I painted this board. You can almost see it there. It kind of worn off. I cut it down 20 years later, 1 million souls, 1,000 partners, and Jesus, number one. That was the vision that we started with in 1983. And then 10 years later, kind of a long story, I won't go through the whole story, but God put me on a seeking time again because I knew there was something more. And what he said to me 10 years later, he said, the, the vision that I gave you 10 years ago was just the beginning. You need to know now, and I got this, Christina, over, over 100 times greater. That's 100 million souls. I'm still trying to figure out how to get the first million back then. Anyway, he said to me, though, but you need to know that it's not just seeing them get saved. It's seeing them disciple and serving me. So since 1993, our ministry vision has been, and it's on the end of every one of these videos. You'll be seeing a few minutes here. But over 100 million souls saved, discipled, and serving God. You know, Christina, all these years, I've wondered how it's going to happen. And what God kept saying to me over and over and over again is we're going to these small churches and, and, and doing videos where there might only be 100 views, occasionally more, sometimes lots. But I said, God, how is it going to happen? And what he would say, Christina, just be faithful. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. Well, here we are, you know, 40 years later, basically. Well, 20. 37 years from the vision point, 40 years of serving the Lord. But five years ago, he downloaded the vision. And we now have the plan, and we're going to be introducing the plan 
next week. And uh, I, you know, for those of you that are watching right now, I asked Christina to be with me to share the plan. And uh, Christina has been part of our focus group as we've been working on the what we call the prayer app. And she's been helping on her focus group studies, and that's really kind of how I got to get to know her. And then from there, we, we got the book. And, and anyway, long story there. But in any event, we are going to be releasing the, the prayer app in September. And what God showed me is all Christians, whether you're Protestant, Catholic, uh, Baptist, Pentecostal, all Christians can agree on two things. Number one, Jesus is Lord. And number two, prayer makes a difference. Next to that, uh, according to Maslow's hierarchy of need, next to food, clothing, and shelter, and love, you know what people need? They need to be needed. And what God showed me is now more than any other time of, of recent history, people know that we have a need to fix a world that's messed up. How are we going to do that? By prayer. So what God showed me is how to build a global community with, we're believing for 1 million people in that global community by the end of September. I know it sounds outrageous, but we have a plan. And not only do we have a plan for 1 million, but when you see the plan, how it's going to unfold with exponential growth, that's why the corporation that's, that's funding all of this and building it is called XO Lens. But in any event, we're, gonna, we're believing for 50 million people to be using the app by the end of October, 100 million by year's end. We're going to unveil all that next week, and I've asked Christina to join me as a co-host, and she's been working on the development with us as an advisor. So I want to invite you back next week. Christina's going to be here with me, and you're going to see the release, and the preview at least, of the plan how we're going to do it, how we're going to change the world, make it a better place, and involve the entire body of Christ working together. So, woo, that's coming up. Christina? Amen. That's you feel, exciting. You, got, you, got, you have a minute? Anything you want well, to say? Yeah. I mean, there's so much to be said to that, David. How glorious. But to comment about just keeping on the theme of running your race. David, you have run a race, and you've been faithful and uh, when you couldn't see and you didn't understand, but you just kept on and kept on down the road uh, uh, going and, and being obedient to the Lord. And now the Lord is unfolding the vision greater than you could ever have imagined because that's how God thinks. He thinks beyond what we can ask or think. And so I just, what an encouraging word for everyone listening because everyone has been given an assignment and, and, and you just keep being faithful in that assignment. And in that faithfulness, God will begin to unfold the assignment uh, for you. And it's always bigger and greater than you can imagine. Thank you for doing that, David. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being obedient because we're all about to see the blessing, the worldwide blessing that God had in his heart. He put in your heart and now it's about to unfold. So glory to God for that, David. Thank Woo! you. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Well, everybody, I want to say thank you for watching the program today. If it's blessed you, like it. Even better yet, share it with uh, others and spread the word. And let me encourage you to come back next week and see the plan and uh, what, what God's going to do. And I want to just say thank you to the many of you that have supported the ministry as a partner. I also want to thank many of you that supported the, the project. The prayer rep, because it's, it's a few hundred thousand dollars of development, and uh, we still are receiving people that want to make you know, be a partner to that to the prayer app. We have a, a crowdfunding program where people can contribute as a capital contribution. Anyway, let me say again, thank you for your faithfulness and being a partner to support the ministry and supporting the prayer app. And uh, have yourself a great, glorious, blessed week. We'll be back here again next Tuesday night, same time, same channel. God bless.